Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of Pottercast. Now, for you Potterheads out there who enjoyed the previous six episodes, this is going to start off the daily format for the show. I'm going to be doing five episodes a week from this day onwards. Now, last night I presented the topic of Ilvermorny School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. So how about this time, we go for the MACUSA, that's the Magical Congress of the United States of America. And um, now this organisation was created in 1693 following the introduction of the International Statute of Wizarding Secrecy. That's Wizards World Rot, uh, which Wizards Worldwide reached. Um, after uh, after Wizards World Right World Worldwide have reached after a tipping point, suspecting that they could lead freer and happier lives if they built an underground community that offered its own support and had its own structures. Now, this feeling actually became particularly strong due to the recent Salem witch trials which ended in 1693. The Makusa was modelled after the Wizards Council of Great Britain, which predated the Ministry of Magic. Representatives from magical communities all over North America were elected to Makusa to create laws that both policed and protected American wizard kind. Now, of course, the Makusa's primary aim was to rid the continent of scourers, corrupt wizards, who had haunted sorry, hunted, who had hunted their fellow magical beings for personal gain. Makusa's second great law enforcement challenge was the number of wizarding criminals who have fled to America from Europe and beyond precisely because of the lack of organised law enforcement such as existed in their own countries. Now, Makusa's first president was Josiah Jackson, a warlike wizard who was voted into post by his fellow representatives because he was considered tough enough to deal with the difficulties of, post, of the post-Salem witch trial era. In these first years, Makusa had no fixed meeting place. Meetings were held in different locations to avoid no match detection. Now, if you paid attention to my last episode, you'll know that a no match is an American muggle. And the term no match, just a quick refresher, stems from no magic. Onto the law enforcement side of it now. And this is President Jackson's immediate priority was to recruit and train Aurors. The names of the first dozen volunteers to train as Aurors in the US have a special place in United States wizarding history. Now, okay, these were, there were so few of them and the challenges they faced were so great that they knew they might be required to lay down their lives when they took the job. The descendants of these witches and wizards have begun, or have been given particular respect in the US ever since. Now, these are the names of the original 12. Okay, the names of the original 12 are 
Wilhelm Fischer or Fischer. Theodard Fontaine. Gondolphus Graves. Robert Grimsditch. Mary Jauncey. Carlos Lopez. Mungo Macduff. Cormac O'Brien. Abraham Potter. We'll get to him in a second. Uh, Batild Roch. Uh, Roche, Helmer Weiss, and Charity Wilkinson. Now, of these 12, only two survived into old age. Charity Wilkinson, who would become Makusa's third president, and Theodore Fontaine, whose direct descendant Agil, um, Agilbert is the present day headmaster of Ilvermorny School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Now, we must also note at this point that Gondolphus Graves, whose family remains influential in American wizarding politics, and Abraham Potter, whose distant relationship to the famous Harry Potter, would be uncovered by eager genealogists centuries later. And now on to the challenges they face. Right, here we go. So yes, America remained one of the hostile environments for magic people, mainly because of the Scourer descendants who have vanished permanently into the nomad community and who kept suspicion of magic alive. Unlike most Western countries, there was no cooperation between the nomad government and Makusa. Initially, an enchanted edifice or edifice was created in the Appalachian Mountains as Makusa headquarters, but over time this became an inconveniently remote location, especially as wizards like nomads were increasingly congregating in cities. Now, here we go. Come 1760, Makusa relocated to Williamsburg, Virginia, home of the flamboyant President Thornton Harkaway. Among many other interests, President Harkaway is credited with breeding crops, dogs that closely resemble Jack Russell's, apart from the forked tail. The crops' devotion to wizards is only surpassed by its aggression towards non-magical people. Unfortunately, President Harkaway's pack savaged several local nomads, who afterwards were only able to bark for a period of 48 hours. This breach of the Statute of Secrecy led to Harkaway leaving office in disgrace. It might not be coincidence that Williamsburg was the first city in the US to have dedicated psychiatric hospital to have a dedicated psychiatric hospital, sorry. Sightings of odd happenings around President Harkaway's residence might account for the admission of no madges who were in fact perfectly sane. Or who were in fact, okay, I don't need to correct myself there. Now, Makusa relocated to Baltimore, where President Abel Fleming and his home had his home. But the outbreak of the Revolutionary War, followed by the arrival of the Nomad Congress in the city made Makusa 
understandably nervous, and they departed for Washington. That's a bad choice of relocation. It was in Washington that President Elizabeth McGillagoddy presided over the infamous Country or Kind debate of 1777. Thousands of witches and wizards from all over America descended upon Makusa to attend this extraordinary meeting, for which the great meeting chamber have magically enlarged. The issue for discussion was did the magic com magical community owe their highest allegiance to the country in which they have made their homes, or to the global underground wizarding community? Were they morally obliged to join American nomadges in their fight for liberation from the British muggles? Or was this simply put, not their fight? Well, simply put, not their fight really, but you know. The arguments for and against intervention were protracted to fight and the fight became vicious. Pro-interventionists argued that they might be able to save lives. Anti-interventionists, that wizards risked their own security by revealing themselves in battle. Messengers were sent to the Ministry of Magic in London to ask whether they intended to fight. A four-word message returned, sitting this one out. McGillagoddy's famous response was even shorter. Mind you do. While officially the American witches and wizards did not engage in battle, unofficially, there were many instances of intervention to protect the nomad neighbours. The nomad neighbours and the wizarding community celebrated Independence Day along with the rest of American society, although not necessarily alongside them. So guys, we are almost to the end of this lesson here. Now, One of the American wizard kind's most significant laws for magic was created in 1790 when Makusa approved to edict an edict to enforce total segregation of the wizarding and nomad communities. Rappaport's law, named after then President Emily Rappaport, was created as a result of one of the worst breaches of the International Statute of Secrecy ever known, a breach in which the daughter of Rappaport's Keeper of Treasure and Dragots and a Scourer descendant almost exposed the existence of magic worldwide. With the passing of Rappaport's law, intermarriage and even friendship between wizards and nomads became illegal in the United States. Now here we go. Makusa's base remained in Washington until 1892, when an unforeseen uprising of the Sasquatch population caused another security breach. Historians place the blame for the rebellious, uh, for the rebellion on Irene uh, <laughs> Needle Dander, head of the body for protection of magical species, Humanoid, whose interpretation of her job title 
had involved attacking any Sasquatch that stepped out of line. The arrival in Washington of the Sasquatch necessitated mass oblivion, uh, ma mass oblivations, and extensive repairs to headquarters. Makusa needed a new refuge, and over the course of several years, wizards infiltrated the construction team of a new building in New York. By the time the Woolworth building was completed, it could both house no magis, and if activated by the correct spells, transform into a space for wizards. The only outer mark of the Makusa's new secret location was the owl carved over the entrance. And we're up to the last section. Makusa in the 1920s. And with the most other magical governing bodies, the Department of Magical Law Enforcement is the largest department in Makusa. Rappaport's law was still in operation in the 1920s, and several offices in Makusa had no counterpart in the Ministry of Magic. For example, the subdivision dealing with nomad fraternization and an office issuing and verifying wand permits, which every, which every one citizen and visitor was supposed to carry within the states. A significant difference between the wizarding governments of the United States and the UK of this time was a penalty for serious crime, whereas British witches and wizards were sent to Azkaban for the worst, cr the worst criminals in America were executed. Okay, now in the 1920s, the president of Makusa was Sarafina Pickery from Savannah, or Piquiri from, from Savannah. The Department of Magical Law Enforcement was headed by Percival Graves, a well-respected descendant of one of the original 12 American authors. And that, my God, and that, my friends, is basically the whole story of the formation of Makusa, their entire history, right up to nineteen twenties. I hope you enjoyed it. And of course, if you want to read the article yourself, there's a link for you in the description. Join me tomorrow as the topic turns on to wizarding currency. Until then, bye bye.